Good evening and welcome to the Australian National University seventh panel discussion on the vote. So this is a 2016 election series seminar and probably many of you have been to other issues in this series. As a one-off, we're in the Coombs Theatre tonight as we were uh, gra graciously, graciously we've had to give up uh, our usual venue for the Crawford Leader Leadership Forum which I understand at least some of our panel members have been attending today. My name's Mark Kenny. I'm the Chief Political Correspondent for Fairfax Media, which means I write for the Mastheads, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and, uh, and even the Canberra Times. Uh, so um, some of you may read some of those old media forms, or the online version, perhaps. Every Tuesday since the federal election was announced, uh, the ANU pol public policy experts have been discussing the key issues of this uh, 2016 election. It's what I spend my days doing as well, discussing the, uh, the key issues and trying to report on them. Uh, and this series is uh, presented by the, in partnership with the Policy Forum Net, which is based at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, if you wish to uh, take part in this conversation via Twitter, the hashtag is OzVotes and our ANU. Tonight I'm joined by four of the university's climate, energy and environmental experts to discuss an issue which uh, has been an incredibly powerful issue in Australia for a long time, indeed globally of course, but uh, an, an incredibly powerful uh, policy issue and political issue in Australia for a long time, uh, but which arguably in this election seems to have um, taken something of a back seat to some other issues. And I guess that's one of the key things we're here to discuss, to talk about the issue and to talk about how, uh, what, why that is and, and how that can be changed. Uh, our first speaker in, in the brown suit, uh, well, when I say first speaker, the one I'm first introducing is Professor Ken Baldwin. Uh, he is a Director of the Energy Change Institute at ANU. He's also Deputy Director of the Research, Research School of Physics and Engineering. He's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Physics, the Institute of Physics in the UK, the Op Optical Society of America, and the American Physical Society. I believe that's correct. Our next speaker is, uh, the, the next that I'm introducing is Mark Howden, Professor Mark Howden. He's the director of the Climate Change Institute at the ANU. He's on the end. Uh, and uh, he's also uh, an honorary professor at Melbourne University's School of Land and Food. Dr. Paul Burke is an economist. He's here in the black suit, closest to me. Dr. Paul Burke is an economist based at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, his work focuses on environmental energy, transport, developing countries, and particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. And Lily, Dem Lily Dempster, closest to me, is currently completing a Master of Energy Change Research at the, or Energy Change uh, research masters at the ANU and has a strong background in Australian in the Australian environmental movement. So, would you please join me in welcoming our expert panel tonight? <laughs> now, as I said, climate change uh, has uh, been an issue that uh, has been absolutely formative in the political uh, fortunes of a number of uh, key Australian politicians and, and governments. It's had an absolutely epic uh, impact on Australian politics as a political issue, uh, but the policy response to it has been patchy, uh, sometimes better than others, and often just, just completely traumatic. So uh, it's an absolutely crucial issue and uh, certainly one that needs to be uh, getting a higher priority than it's uh, currently getting in this, uh, in this epic and long election campaign. We might start with some opening statements from our panel. Um, if, I could, uh, if I could ask you, uh, Professor Baldwin, to kick off and maybe make a, an opening statement. Certainly, Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for coming on uh, what is a uh, very cold, windy and almost snowy evening here in Canberra. Uh, perhaps not evidence of warming, but uh, certainly evidence of maybe an extreme event on the way. Um, so uh, I guess I'm couching uh, my language in terms of climate change. And uh, indeed, this is one of the big drivers uh, uh, behind uh, energy change, which is uh, what my institute is involved in. Uh, what I'm seeing uh, over the last decade or so in Australia uh, is enormous uh, government policy uncertainty and uh, this has uh, led to uh, changes in uh, laws, regulations uh, and has meant that uh, there's not been the, uh, the, the atmosphere uh, 
uh, and the, uh, the environment for industry to invest in, in new energy sources that, uh, that there should be. Uh, and uh, as we look at the uh, policy platforms of the major parties, uh, so I'm talking about here the Coalition, Labor and the Greens, uh, what we see is a diversity of approach. Uh, now at least uh, uh, with the uh, Turnbull administration there's an agreement uh, about climate change, but what we're seeing now is a diversity of approach to uh, solving climate change. And of course, energy is one of the big solutions uh, in that space. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we are still in a very uncertain environment. Uh, and indeed, uh, what we've seen in the past, uh, and, and we're going to no doubt see in the future, uh, is uh, what I call the destructive adversarial politics of opposition. In other words, you simply oppose something because it's the other party that's put it forward. And you know, there are many examples of this. The NBN's a good example. Uh, the GST, when it was originally formulated back in the early uh, Howard years, that sort of thing. So uh, this isn't very helpful when it comes to dealing with issues of national, let alone global importance. You need a combined uh, approach to solutions. Uh, and so bipartisanship is, is essential in this space. Uh, and for example, uh, we, uh, we need the, the, the certainty uh, of a price on carbon so that everyone can plan uh, to uh, invest, uh, whether it be in energy sources or in other parts of the economy, based on the knowledge of, of what the uh, carbon price is going to be. And first of all, you have to have a price on carbon. We didn't have one, and then we did have one, and now we don't have one again, and maybe we'll have another one. And all this is incredibly uh, destructive when it comes to uh, industry trying to invest. So we need to change that. We need to have bipartisan agreement uh, over, over particularly these types of issues. And I'd also say that uh, although we have a, a, a very good electricity market uh, in Australia, it's a 20th century electricity market. Uh, and it needs to move into the 21st century in order to adapt not just to the imperatives of climate change and the need to, uh, to shift our, our energy generation sources. It also needs to adapt to modern technology for the ability for you as individuals to generate your own electricity, to store it in batteries in your own home, to re-export it onto the grid at a price that suits you. And I'm talking about a price that follows the, the demand curve uh, on a diurnal and a seasonal cycle. At the moment you can't do that. And there is technology out there that can do it and the market just won't let you do that. So this shift to distributed renewables in particular needs to be reflected in market rules. So I think those are things that really this election uh, should be focusing on. Uh, Kim, would you like to... Oh, sorry, uh, Mark. Um, like Ken, I'd like to welcome you to ANU uh, to this series as well. So my name is Mark Howden. I'm the director of the Climate Change Institute here at ANU. Uh, the Climate Change Institute brings together the, the research capabilities across the ANU, uh, connects those and also connects them externally to ANU. So in terms of this uh, sort of absence of climate change in this election campaign, I think it's really uh, important, is that I actually see that dealing with climate change effectively is a core plank in terms of attaining a just and sustainable society, both here and internationally. It's not an add-on, it actually needs to be integrated into the, the main game of actually getting towards that sort of goal. And when we actually start to look at uh, the sort of pathways to meeting the Paris Agreement, and also the goals more broadly of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's avoiding dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate, uh, system. Often this is seen with a very much accountancy framework. It's all seen as about costs. It's the cost of reducing carbon emissions. It's the cost of adapting to climate change. It's actually not seen in the way I think it should be seen, which is actually an investment in our future in terms of having sustainable systems, energy systems, environmental systems. So I think we actually need to start thinking about this as part of a national investment strategy, which is part of our innovation system. It's not separate from our innovation system. So when we actually start to think about this, um, adaptation, which is adjusting to future climate changes, and we expect, we've seen a lot already, but we expect to see a lot more of those changes. And it makes a lot of sense to adapt to those changes. If you don't adapt to those changes, you'll either incur unnecessary risk, which costs money, or you'll actually underperform. So if you're in agriculture, you'll actually produce less than you otherwise would. And neither of those are desirable from a business point of view, individual point of view, or a national point of view. So we really need to get on the front foot in terms of adaptation and dealing with climate change. 
And if we actually look at the platforms of the three major parties, that's uh, Labor, Liberal National Party and the Greens, none of them, full stop, have anything significant to say about climate adaptation. They talk about energy, they talk about emissions reduction, they don't actually talk about adaptation to climate change. Yet that's actually an equally important part. That's the other side of the climate change coin and it's completely missing. And that, I don't think that's in the national interest. And the other thing that is missing is largely mention of the 65% of emissions that aren't associated with the electricity generation sector. So it's the agricultural emissions, the industrial emissions, the waste emissions, the fugitive emissions, things like that. So we're actually missing a big part of the adaptation um, picture and we're missing a big part of the mitigation picture. So I think we actually have a lot of room to do better. Now, Australia has a history when we actually get our act together of having really pragmatic and effective innovations. And if we do this well, I, don't, I think it is not only a contributor potentially to our innovation system, but I think we can actually make a really big difference internationally as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, Paul, can I invite you to uh, make an opening statement? Yeah, hi, good evening everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Burke, an economist here at the Crawford School at ANU. Welcome to ANU. Uh, so we have come to the end of a, a term of parliament in which we've definitely made some big steps backwards in terms of climate policy. Uh, so we did have a carbon price, of course, which was in place for two years. Uh, as an economist, I, of course, was, was rather fond of the carbon price, as most economists actually were, especially ones who were, who were thinking much about the problem of climate change. Uh, so we had the carbon price in, in place for two years and actually it was doing the job uh, that was expected of it. Uh, so emissions, for example, in the electricity sector were falling. They had been falling a little bit before the carbon price was in place, but they, they kept falling and fell quite quickly at, by about altogether about 9% during the two years of carbon pricing. Uh, of course, the carbon price was removed um, and since then we've had a rebound in emissions. They've gone up a few percent in the electricity sector for example. Uh, so that was as expected. Um, and it, it is a pity from, a, from an economic point of view and from a, a climate policy point of view that we have gone through this turbulent time in terms of our pol policy settings. And that's introduced uncertainty going forward as well. Uh, economists often, often say that uh, we can judge how seriously someone takes this issue of climate change by what they say about the carbon price. Um, and I guess actually the tone in this election has, has improved somewhat um, in that uh, the, the scare campaign of, of previous elections has been toned down somewhat in, in this one. Um, but then at the same time, the carbon price hasn't been spoken about much as well. Uh, if we look at the policies of the different uh, parties, um, well, Labor is, is proposing to introduce two emissions trading schemes. So one for the electricity sector a baseline and credit scheme, uh, and a second one for industry as well, which would be what is called a cap and offset scheme. So both of these schemes, probably they would start as being quite light touch schemes with probably quite a low carbon price, but at least that would put the infrastructure in place uh, and they could be tightened up over time. The coalition, uh, it's a little bit harder to read exactly what they plan to do, but there is some speculation that perhaps their policy in terms of the safeguard mechanism could one day be tightened up into an emissions trading scheme as well, but, but we're yet to see that. In terms of some other parties, the, the Nick Xenophon team is proposing an emissions trading scheme, a baseline and credit emissions trading scheme. The Greens are proposing a carbon price. Uh, just one policy at the moment, which I've been looking into quite a lot, uh, and really is the centrepiece of our climate policy at the moment, is the direct action scheme. Uh, so this is a subsidy scheme to pay for emissions reductions from specific individual projects across the economy. Uh, so there are quite a few problems with this scheme. The scheme is doing some good activities and, and purchasing some, some abatement or emissions reductions. But some of that spending is going to actually to projects which most likely would have happened anyway. Uh, quite a lot of the funding has gone to preserving some trees near, or well, some, some scrub near Cobar and Burke in northern New South Wales. And so that spending, it, whether it has actually bought emissions reductions, uh, is very questionable. Would those farmers have been planning to, to clear that land without that spending? And some of the other projects as well uh, have not been particularly impressive in terms of the emissions reductions they are providing. 
Uh, so that direct action might be something we could talk about tonight. Absolutely, I think direct action uh, does need certain, uh, you know, f further program. Um, and, and I think just the overall complexity of the architecture you laid out there is uh, is very interesting because it says one of the key things about this whole area that I think uh, keeps it alienated from uh, from the political process, and that is just its sheer complexity. Uh, you know, the technical aspects of it. Uh, Lily, can I invite you to make an opening statement? Thanks, Mark. Uh, so my background's a little bit different. Uh, I'm a community advocacy campaigner. Most of my work's been with GetUp, working on clean energy consumer campaigns. So I have a slightly different perspective. Um, and I think the, the main concern f for me looking at the, both major parties' policies is, you know, they both have emission reduction targets, um, you know, in line with the Paris Agreement, the 26 to 28% reduction on 2005 levels for the coalition government and a 45% reduction, uh, both by 2030, uh, but the 45% reduction target for the Labor Party. Um, so that's fantastic, um, given where we were a few years ago. The concern really is how uh, well and how quickly can we help Australia transition to a clean energy economy and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. And when you look at the $2.55 billion emission reduction fund, um, and as Paul's already pointed out, uh, you know that issue with additionality um, and the fact that you're basically paying polluters to reduce their emissions through taxpayer money. Uh, there's obviously better policy designs uh, available. Um, and I think also the other thing that I've kind of noticed uh, is that both major parties have, ref at this point, are not reviewing the very large amount of annual fossil fuel sub subsidies. So um, an obvious one is the fuel tax cre credit scheme that goes to the mining industry um, predominantly, um, and that if you're trying to set a price signal to reduce um, reduce incentives to pollute um, and to reduce and you want to reduce carbon emissions, having uh, you know about six billion dollars per year in fossil fuel subsidies probably is re is reducing the effectiveness of those um, either a carbon price or or emission reduction fund um, grants programs. So. That's been concerning for me, just that neither major party wants to review those fossil fuel subsidies or conduct a kind of cost-benefit analysis. And if you think about in the past, you know, we had a national debate on whether we should be providing a subsidy to the Australian car industry for much, much less money. Uh, and that's something that I don't think has been mentioned at all much in the commentary uh, around the climate policy in this election. Thank you, Lily. Um, I, I might just go to some of these issues now uh, that have been raised. Um, obviously, uh, the question of um, the, the politics of all of this is, is really almost the primary question, because if we can't get some level of, uh, of political agreement, uh, if someone cannot claw out a, a political mandate to, do, uh, to take action, then um, we seem to be stuck in... Uh, in, in at least a second, a second best position, rather than uh, you know moving at the speed we need to be moving. And Malcolm Turnbull, it, I mean, it, it, I find it fascinating. I imagine many people in this room find it fascinating and surprising, and perhaps depressing in some ways that um, we actually have now, presumably, a fairly high level of consensus across the political leadership of this country about the need, or first about the primary question about. Uh, climate change, about uh, the, the human impact of uh, climate alteration, uh, and and we have a prime minister who famously has built his political career uh, partly around this issue, and yet we now have policy which I think uh, mostly is regarded around the world as, as fairly mediocre, fairly uh, very much a political compromise. So I wonder if uh, if anyone would like to jump in on any of those uh, points and uh, take it up from there. Ken, perhaps. So certainly what you say is true. Uh, I mean, our emissions uh, targets of 26 to 28% reductions fall at the sort of uh, tail end of the OECD countries. I think only Japan lies behind us. And uh, so uh, we're not exactly leading from the front, we're leading from the back. And uh, that's not a good position to be in. We are, don't forget, uh, from a, uh, an export perspective, one of the world's great energy exporters. Uh, we export huge amounts of uh, coal, we're going to export huge amounts of gas, we export around about a third of the world's uranium uh, usage, uh, and, and so we have, a, <coughs> in some sense, a, uh, a very uh, uh, strong moral high ground or 
depending on how you look at the high ground, uh, in terms of being a major energy exporter. So we also have a responsibility in that direction as well. If you look at us uh, as a domestic uh, energy user, uh, we derive 85% of our energy from fossil fuels. And uh, that picture hasn't changed uh, in recent times, uh, even though renewables are increasing in, in usage. Uh, and uh, we are the most <coughs> carbon intensive uh, economy in the world in that regard. Now, uh, in terms of uh, you know, how this is uh, moving uh, in the political sphere, we, sh we, we certainly have, as Mark said, agreement uh, about climate and the need to do something about it. The real point of difference in this election, and if you look at the election policies, there are points of difference. So uh, let's, let's not uh, say that we're not hearing anything in the press about climate change just because everyone agrees. They don't agree. The, the, the methodology for doing something about climate change is different in every party. Uh, and uh, we'll come back to this question as to why it's not in the media, but uh, if we look at uh, direct action, direct action is all about, um, a, if you like, a, an auctioning process of uh, uh, trying to uh, buy uh, the carbon uh, back out of the atmosphere so that we don't emit it. Uh, and this is fine in certain sectors, uh, but as uh, Paul says, some of these things might have happened anyway. Uh, whereas uh, an emissions trading scheme is being proposed by the Labor Party and uh, carbon price uh, proposed by the Greens, that aims to hit the um, carbon pollution uh, everywhere in the economy and especially in the energy sector. So Labor has a, a two-tier process. There's a emissions trading scheme for the energy sector and something else for everyone else. Uh, and you need to do this uh, through a carbon price because everyone gets the price signal then. If you only have a price signal for some parts of the economy, you're not driving behaviour change in the other parts of the economy. Whereas if it's in the carbon price, everyone will try and minimise their costs of production and the cost of their product to sell to you. And if that means getting rid of the carbon content in your product because it's going to cost you more, they'll do it. Whereas without that price signal, the only part of the economy where there will be uh, a, um, a reduction in, in emissions will be those where you actually directly purchase it, which is what direct action is all about. So there are clear differences in approach between the parties uh, and we need to uh, examine uh, what we believe to be the most effective. Would anyone else like to uh, make a comment on that? Just on the question of the, 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 the I suppose that what we're talking about here is the disconnect between the, the, the science, the policy and the politics and how we can actually address that. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from you, Paul, actually on direct action and whether it is actually a market mechanism. This is a claim the government makes. It, would you say as an economist that it is? Well, the, the auction, the reverse auction process for deciding which projects will be funded is a market mechanism. Um, but this is not the type of broad market mechanism that can trigger a change in, in the direction of an economy. Um, but just going back to the, to the next term of Parliament, I, I, I mean, I think there is just a, a skerrick of, of optimism that uh, could be held, and for several reasons. One, one is that renewable prices are just reducing so quickly, um, and in a way that was, by some, unexpected several years ago. Number two is that some of our coal-fired generators are really getting rather old. Um, so these are underlying factors. And, I guess a number three as well is that we've just had a bleaching event in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we have increased understanding, I believe, in, in uh, the science of climate change. So there's just a chance if we had some leadership from the next government and also really leadership from the next opposition as well, uh, because for important reforms, ideally we would, we would have some type of backing from the opposition or at least a, a, an opposition type of campaign that is not toned up to the maximum. So there is, I think, just a little bit of a, a prospect for some, some uh, for a better outcome, certainly next parliament than this one. Lee, did you want to make a point? Uh, just the comment that um, the government's uh, committed to a review of climate policy to come out in 2017, uh, but they haven't actually specified really how they're going to reduce, how they're going to meet their emission reduction target. Um, you know, the, the amount of money committed to emission reductions under direct action doesn't extend past the $2.55 billion. Um, and they have a suite of other measures um, that they've announced, basically borrowing or taking money from the Clean Energy Finance Corporation's original $10 billion allocation, uh, you know, and, and the announcements they've made about the Clean Energy Innovation Fund and now protection from that bucket of money. 
Um, so that's been kind of interesting just in terms of while there hasn't been uh, much talk about climate policy explicitly, the government are making a series of, of announcements during the election campaign that uh, make it look like they want to do things to support clean energy, um, but with money that's actually been already committed and that they haven't been able to, they haven't been able to uh, repeal the body that initially was, was able to make that money available to clean energy um, groups, which was the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So, so, so is it possible that in some ways we're kind of stumbling towards some sort of policy process, some sort of policy progress, I should say, here? I mean, Malcolm Turnbull, technically the coalition when it came in was utterly committed to getting rid of ARENA, getting rid of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which was, you know, pilloried as Bob Brown's bank and all this sort of stuff. Um, but now the Clean Energy Finance Corporation is a critical part of the uh, policy infrastructure of the, of the, or architecture of the, of the government. We've just seen an announcement about how a section of that's going to be used for uh, protecting or at least helping to uh, protect the, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we also know that um, Malcolm Turnbull would have gone further had he been able to, but he had done a deal as part of his um, uh, gathering of the numbers to knock off Tony Abbott. He had done a deal not to change uh, the, the governments, not to accelerate or, or, or argue for a, a higher target at the Paris climate change talks or to change that policy along with same-sex marriage, uh, which is not related to this, but uh, nonetheless a, a fairly important issue as well to a lot of people. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you think, does anyone on the panel think that, you know, as, as Paul said, there, there is at least some optimism that maybe we're going to get there in, in a slightly messy, uncoordinated way, but that this um, political goodwill and belief that exists at least at the top of the coalition government, uh, that may uh, get us there. Mark, uh, you have a view about that? <coughs> Probably not, not uh, wanting to engage on this particular part of it. Uh, I, I would just responding to your previous comment, which was really about um, differences between the parties. When it comes to uh, climate adaptation, which is dealing with uh, the climate changes that are happening now and may happen in the future, um, there is no difference between the parties because none of them have a policy. And so, um, so when they actually start to bring that out, then we'll actually be able to judge uh, how significant they are. Now, in terms of why this might be, <coughs> it, it, it could be that um, they see. Uh, um, a, you know, admission or, or, or a policy on adaptation is an admission of failure in terms of their mitigation programs, their emission reduction programs. Uh, whereas, in fact, I think it would be much better seen as an acknowledgement of reality and an effective and appropriate response to those changes we're, we're seeing. So, so I actually think there is a dose of reality that needs to come into this, and, and I would welcome uh, some leadership by. Uh, any of the uh, key players in terms of acknowledging that and starting some action. Is there too big a gap between um, between experts such as yourselves and policymakers? I mean, it, it's, it seems to me this gap, I can almost feel it here right now. Um, that, that we have to get the politics right in order to uh, get the policy right. If you can't if you can't drive the change politically, then it doesn't really matter how pure the policy description, you know, the cons uh, prescriptions are that you come up with, uh, or the research that you do, if it can't drive policy. I think, uh, I mean, it's a good point, um, but, but I think the bigger gap there is not so much the, the research community and the, the politicians, rather than the policy makers, but the politicians. It's actually uh, a gap between public viewpoints and uh, the policy makers and politicians. So, for example, Vote Compass says that 74% of Australians who participated in that survey want more action on climate change. Um, so, you know, in, in a political terms, that's a vast majority, and, and yet we're not seeing that connecting to appropriate policy responses. So, I'd actually say that rather than us being the key source of the gap between us and the politicians, it's actually the politicians and the public where the key gap is. Well, I think it's an interesting point, and I, I accept that. I think it's a very good point, but there is nonetheless a job to be done in terms of um, designing the, the, the policy responses here, and it is highly technical. It is, it is bewildering for the average voter. Um, many of the terms that are being used here tonight would be bewildering to the average voter, and, that's, and so there's an alienation process, it seems to me, and that gives, that allows politicians to get off scot-free to some extent. It allows them to construct a, an eight-week election campaign uh, which is interrupted by you know, one of the worst East Coast lows we've seen for a long time and which many would say is a function of a more turbulent climate. Um, 
and, and yet it doesn't really manifest as a as a you know major political issue. So, you know, that somewhere here there's a it's a pretty big disconnect. I, I think uh, that when it comes to engaging directly with governments of either persuasion, uh, it's up to universities to engage closely so that we can provide expert advice. And indeed, as in my institute, we have a policy of being both technology and policy neutral. So. We will push every form of technology, we'll push every policy idea as hard as we can, and then offer them up as options for, for people to take up. And, and it's really important that uh, we do that because uh, if we disconnect uh, for whatever reason from, uh, from either government or opposition, then they no longer have a, a, a trusted source of expert advice to call upon. And, uh, and so really, if universities can't provide that advice, who can? So it really is a very important role for us to continue to stay engaged. And I think we are engaged. I mean, we've talked to both government and opposition over the years uh, on many occasions. Uh, but I think that, uh, as you say, there is probably more of a disconnect between what the uh, parties are doing in this election and what the public want them to do uh, than we've seen for a long time. In fact, I'd like to pose a question to the audience doing the boat compass thing here. So how many people think that uh, we should be doing more about climate change. Okay, so that's a bit, more than, a bit more than 74%. <laughs> you're, a, you're a random sample, right? <laughs> and, and those against? <laughs> so, so now I'm going to ask a, a, another question, a very different question. How many of you think that climate change is being addressed adequately by either side of politics in this election? How many think it's being addressed adequately? Doesn't matter what political party you're talking about, by either side of politics, how many think it's addressed adequately in this election? None. Okay, so there's your disconnect. That is a very big disconnect. Um, it doesn't say a lot for, I mean, it, it seems to me that Labor feels that it is uh, leaning quite a long way into the wind. Uh, Bill Shorten obviously <coughs> had some people, no doubt had some people in his ear saying, don't go anywhere near a carbon tax again after what happened to Labor in 2013, one of the most politically toxic issues that we've seen prosecuted in Australian politics. Uh, and, and yet uh, he has gone back to a carbon price, as Paul said, he's come up with a, a policy, which I, I suspect very few Australians would be able to articulate, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a, it's a stronger policy than um, some Conservatives would have uh, wanted to see. So it's interesting to hear that uh, not only is our, you know, uh, uh, not only are our fairly mediocre official targets not uh, inspiring people, but even the opposition's tougher policy doesn't doesn't get a single hand in the room. Uh, I think one interesting point is um, looking at the polling on climate change, and certainly that vote compass um, piece by the ABC, which was of over 250,000 people, and that was a weight, you know, weighted to be uh, proportional with the population. Um, and that was, I think it was 63% of those people um, who, who participated in the Vote Compass poll supported uh, a carbon price. Um, but that doesn't actually tell you whether they'd be willing to change their vote um, based on whether a, a, a particular party supported a carbon price. And um, the Reach Tell poll in May that showed um, people would be willing to change their vote, about 66% of people um, on the protection of the Great Barrier Reef. So that's why you see this, um, these big policy announcements from both the Labor Party and, and the Coalition um, on protecting the reef. I think 500 million committed from Labor and over five years and a billion from the Coalition government over 10. Now, we might uh, take some questions now from, uh, from you. Uh, we'll, uh, we're going to get microphones to you so that, uh, so that everyone can hear what you have to say. We have one just here in the middle. Uh, a microphone making its slightly awkward way to you now. Uh, can, can you identify yourself uh, when you ask a question and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank sure, you. my name is Rod Holsgrove. A few things. I think there is a clear difference between uh, Labor and uh, certainly the Coalition, uh, but I think what we're hearing is correct. For some reason, Labor's not coming out with I think they've got, I mean, there's four big areas. their targets, there's you know, it's a pricing scheme on renewables, on the land sector, and I think on, on there's some, we've got some stuff on cars, for example, but it's just not coming out. I think there's a fault there on Labor, perhaps Mark, you're right, they've been frightened off, or Shorten's been frightened off. I think also there's a 
the, you're right, Mark, that it's a technical issue, and the media don't seem to be able to handle it. When you ever hear interviews, and I tend to, it's mainly ABC I listen to, they, they just can't ask pertinent questions on policy, which is a little bit of a shame because some of the stuff is pretty straightforward. A price, as we've heard from Ken, for example, the, the uh, pricing you can pretty well easily explain that, you know, it's how important it is, but it's, not being, it's never been brought out, it's not being brought out in this campaign. Uh, I should also say I'm not optimistic about the future. I don't know if Turnbull wins, I don't think he's going to have a reduced majority and the right's still going to be there. So whether he's going to be able to do anything much on climate change. And I just say to Mark, as I was in the uh, environment department some years ago, there, there was, and worked for Labor for time, so you can probably see my glasses, but there was, Labor did have some stuff on adaptation, which I think CSRA had too, which may have gone. I don't know whether you can comment on that, but. There, yeah, there's nothing there now. And it certainly hasn't been addressed by either party. I agree with that, so it's more comment I'm afraid, I guess. Uh, I appreciate that. Anyone who'd like to comment? Just, just on this topic of, of the complicated nature of climate policy, I mean, many other areas are actually very complicated as well. For example, superannuation, or the health system, or, or Gonski funding, for example. They're complicated policy areas. Um, and actually, climate change policy does not really need to be quite as complicated. What is happening with our emissions? Are they going up or down? Currently they're going up. Uh, do we have a policy that will be able to credibly get us to, to a target in the future? Currently we, we don't. Um, and what are the targets of the different parties? And when we look across those targets, there's of course lots of variation. The government 26 to 28 per cent by 2030 and Labor 45 per cent. That's quite a big difference. Um, so on some basic parts of the policy, uh, it, it should be easy to communicate, but what really is just needed is, is leadership and focus on, on the topic. And can I just respond to your comments about the media, and given our media chair here, um, I'll be diplomatic. Um, <laughs> so, so I actually don't think the media are that bad. Uh, the journalists that I talk to all get it. I mean, they're, they're pretty good at understanding uh, tricky technical discussions. I get very good questions from them, uh, and you know, you, you might listen to the ABC and watch the ABC. The ABC interviewed me for three minutes during a news program on prime time, and that's unusual. I mean, that's very unusual. They could get into depth and detail and ask me tricky questions, and I think that's a good thing. There should be more of it. But um, when it comes to the politicians' reaction to the media, uh, we had a dinner last night uh, with uh, Arthur Sinodinus and, and with uh, our uh, shadow treasurer of Owen, they both commented about the 24-hour media cycle. Okay, so now this is a serious issue. Uh, it means that people speak in sound bites, uh, they don't get into uh, in-depth uh, discussions and they don't have time to think about things. Well, Chris Bowen had a solution to that. He was rung up one morning and asked to comment on something that was announced by the, uh, uh, by the opposition. Uh, and uh, he realised that this was actually quite a difficult issue. And so rather than doing what his media advisor said, which was to give them a response right now, otherwise the Twitter sphere will go nuts, uh, he said, no, you tell them, I will come back to them later in the day and I'll give them a considered response. And that's exactly what he did. And did the uh, media go away? No, they didn't. So it's about your own perception of what the media are going to do that is the key issue. If you say, bugger off, and I'll come back to you later with a considered response, that will still work, okay? So the 24-hour media cycle, in some sense, is entirely a structure of our own making, and we can still do something about it. I don't know what your thoughts are, Mark. Well, my thoughts are with the 24-hour me media cycle is that uh, I, I never seem to get to knock off, um, <laughs> and, uh, and and I mean that. I mean, it's, I was just talking with Chris Yorman about this today, just before the, the press club lunch, and we were agreeing that the the problem is that you know comparing this election campaign, say from previous election campaigns, is that they, we just have rolling deadlines now. Everyone's doing everything, so we're doing video on our websites, and we're doing we're putting up stories contemporaneously, and so it is. Everything's accelerating like that, and uh, it, it, um, um, it's full of opportunities, but uh, there's, there's no downtime. So I'd make that observation. Uh, we have another question. We have one here in the middle. If you could just state your name, please. Um, hey, uh, my name is Ram. I'm a student of the uh, energy, uh, Masters of Energy Change here at the FDA and you. 
Um, so Ken, you made an interesting point about um, Australia's large energy exports. Um, so my panel, or my question to the panel is, how do you think Australia should take responsibility for our exports, our energy exports? Considering, uh, for example, that we want to take responsibility for our live exports, should we you know, do something similar? So you want us to comment on our responsibility for our debt exports, is that right? <laughs> Um, okay, so that's, uh, so this is a really interesting question. Uh, so one way of, a, of approaching this is to join with all the other countries that signed the Paris Agreement and commit to a reduction in our emissions uh, using a worldwide framework that will take place once 55 nations representing 55% of global emissions agree to do this. And you don't need to necessarily take uh, some unilateral position on exporting energy to other parts of the world to be a part of this process. Let's say that uh, you know down the track uh, the post-Paris agreements uh, come up with a worldwide uh, price on carbon that means that over time uh, fossil fuels become a thing of the past. Well that is one way of uh, participating in this global process. Uh, so taking unilateral action and saying oh, we're not going to export coal tomorrow because it's dirty, is going to consign large sections of the developing world to poverty and uh, to inequality simply because they cannot uh, uh, meet their energy needs in the short term while we're making this transition to a carbon-free world. So we have to think very carefully what unilateral action in the energy export domain might mean. And uh, the same is also true of uranium. So we are custodians of these commodities and we sell them to the rest of the world. Uh, but I think it's a very difficult position to take that uh, we should tell the rest of the world what to do. We should participate in a global scheme that has the goals that everyone wants to make us carbon neutral globally. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, taking a unilateral position is very difficult. It's an interesting, can I just make a, a clarification then we'll come to you. It's an interesting point, this question about leadership uh, and what, what role we should play and how far out in front of the world we should get on, in some of these policy areas in, in climate uh, carbon abatement and perhaps in the, in, as you say, in a, an area like taking responsibility for our energy exports. Malcolm Turnbull recently in criticising Labor's policy, in criticising Shorten's uh, uh, harsher targets, uh, said that uh, what Bill Shorten was doing was giving away Australia's bargaining position in international negotiations. It was a very novel argument, uh, and I'm being kind. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, to me, I, I, it, it, it was loyally, it was, it was, it was the, a skillful barrister taking an apparently hostile set of facts and turning them to advantage. That's the way I saw it, and you know, I don't mind saying so. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the, I suppose this does feed back to some extent into the, uh, the complexity of this overall area. Um, Australians, for example, are told that, you know, we have, hear all this debate about what we should do and what, what it's going to cost the economy and how much, how much risk there is involved in it and so forth. And then we're told, and by the way, we produce less than 1% of global emissions, so none of what we do, even if we killed off our carbon production completely, would have any implication for, you know, for, for global climate, for example. So I think it is politically and technically complicated at the same time. I was just going to comment, uh, Ram, that uh, Australia, there's a, a figure running around, um, I read it in an Australian Conservation Foundation report, that uh, we, need, we can't burn 90% of our fossil fuel reserves in Australia if we want to stay under the 450 parts per million um, limit. Um, so... <laughs> I mean, there's, there's some physical limitations if we want to um, do our fair share on uh, emissions reductions as a country. Um, but we are heavily reliant on, on coal. You know, it's, it's still a major export for Australia and, and both the Coalition and, and the Australian Labor Party support um, coal continuing to be a major export for Australia into the future. Um, what's difficult about the current policy discourse is it doesn't acknowledge that, that physical constraint around the global carbon budget and Australia's contribution, you know, that it could potentially blow the global carbon budget um, if we do just continue to export our fossil fuel reserves. I think the other point that's interesting is uh, that countries like India and China are really trying to um, improve their energy independence just for their own energy security, 
Um, they're both heavily investing in um, renewable energy, but also trying to rely more on domestic coal production um, rather than uh, importing from Australia. So I think the economic reality for Australia's coal export market is that we actually have to have a sophisticated plan for how we're going to transition away from relying on that export market. And, and obviously, both parties see investment in clean energy as a component of that. But I don't think we've gone far enough in really addressing that problem. And uh, there is another sort of element to this, Ram, um, which is actually about uh, um, alignment with the international uh, process so for uh, assessing emissions. Um, so, for example, uh, all of the greenhouse gas emissions are associated um, with combustion at the point in, point of emissions, or you know, production <coughs> of, of the emissions, and and so those are slated to particular nations. And so, the importance of that, and, and this was designed into those inventory systems a long time ago, because it was recognised there had to be an alignment of responsibility and accountability in terms of those emissions. And the only exceptions for those are called bunker fuels, which are the international shipping and international air. Um, flight fuels for aeroplanes, which are actually sort of sit outside that in, um, national based accounting. Um, so, so um, if you wanted to start, uh, you know, going and saying, okay, well, who's responsible for the emissions associated with Australian coal? Um, you actually start to get real problematic things. So, if that coal goes to, you know, country A and then it goes country B and then it goes country C before it gets combusted, you actually have to track it all the way along that cycle, which just becomes a nightmare. So from a point of view of simplicity, a point of view of aligning responsibility and accountability, um, that's why we've got national-based emission inventories. I have a question in the middle here. Thank um, you. If you could just state you. your name, please. Thank you. Julie Chase is my name. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that um, discussion we had, you had earlier about the gap between uh, the, political, the major political parties' support and action on climate change and, and the people's view on the matter. Um, but just add to that a, a couple of uh, extra things. One is that, you know, the role of the media in, in picking up these uh, issues and, and running with them. Um, I think there's been a, a sea change in that over the last three to five years. Uh, it was quite dismal some years ago. Um, but there's certainly been a lot of education amongst the journalists and the coverage is pretty good now, but that is another really important and continuing um, aspect of bringing this uh, debate in a sensible way to the people and to the politicians. But one area that I, I think is um, not given quite enough attention is the role of um, lobby groups on, on the various poli political parties. So, you know, it might be that the voters get some some of the uh, uh, the action, but um, but from the other side, uh, the lobby groups are really important as well. Um, and of course, there's the you know the coal industry and the mining industry, and then there's the unions. Um, but it, it's always seemed to me very interesting that um, that in terms of um, the economic costs and benefits of um, action on climate change or climate change happening, there's a whole sec section of um, business that is really going to be impacted in one way or another, which doesn't actually get much voice in this argument. You know, like the insurance industry, for example, uh, the tourism industry, um, um, you know, even um, ma manufacturing uh, using renewables or those sorts of things. And um, I wonder whether um, whether anybody's got any comment on, you know, what what should be done to actually get those those companies, those, and we're talking about big companies here that have major influence on government and who are losing out by governments not taking action, what, what we might be able to do to include those more in the debate and get them to speak out and be a little bit more brave about this issue. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's a really important uh, issue, that question of, um, of, of what corporates do, the question of business investment certainty in policy settings, the sort of timelines that they need. The, the, the essential pragmatism of business on these questions is there to be leveraged in terms of making progress on policy. But in your final comments there, you, uh, you, you made the observation, I believe, correct observation, that uh, business, generally speaking, is very timid in the public policy space, and particularly so when it comes to you know, highly partisan or contested political areas. So, um, yeah, some real challenges there. Anyone else would like to comment? Uh, yes, I'd like to echo that. I think business does stay out of the public policy debate quite a lot. But on the other hand, they also lead it. So um, 
when it comes to uh, the realities of the world, it's, you know, the big companies, the big energy companies uh, looking into the future and they're thinking, okay, we're going to have a carbon neutral world in 2050. Okay, let's make that the assumption. What do we need to do to make money in 2050? They don't have a philosophical fixation to coal or gas or oil or whatever. All they want to do is make money, right? So they change the way that they make money from now to 2050. That's their long-term goal. And uh, they might be ahead of the game because many companies now include a carbon price in their planning process. So for example, uh, the uh, current government's uh, target of 26 to 28% emissions reductions by 2030 is the, is the national uh, indicated uh, goal. And so companies at this moment are looking at what effectively that means in terms of a price of car on carbon that would achieve the 26 to 28% by 2030. They then use that price on carbon to factor into their business, whatever it is, it might be generating electricity, it might be manufacturing, it might be agriculture. And they work out what the carbon price equivalent is and they use that even though there's not a carbon price. So business is ahead of the game and business will be the solution. Look at what's happening in China. China manufactures the greatest number of solar panels in the world and the greatest number of wind turbines in the world. Not because they want to save the world, but because it makes money. And big companies like, you know, the big oil companies are shifting the way in which they do business to still make money in 2050, but they won't be producing oil. They'll be doing something else. Paul? I, I'd just like to agree with the comments from the questioner. Uh, and when a, a future government or, or the current government um, does make more progress with climate policy, if there is an, a new carbon price or an emissions trading scheme or similar, um, then that really is a time when the Australian community <coughs> needs to get behind them, I think. Um, and the key challenge really is that people who are and the companies making money from emitting are doing so at the moment and they are there and there's a lot of money on the line, it's true. Uh, so in our previous carbon pricing reform, there, were, there was a uh, lot big campaigns from, from companies and from, from lobby groups to try to, to end the price and in the end they were successful. Um, but next time around, really, uh, the banks and others um, hopefully will, will come out of the woodwork a bit more and, and really get behind the government. Uh, we have a question in up here. Yes. Um, Daniel Poposky from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, one of the major concerns raised out of the business community is the issue of carbon linkage, uh, which entails business investment basically being deflected to countries without climate policy and leading to higher, higher emissions in the longer term. What strategies do you suggest we take in convincing the business community that a carbon price or an ETS is the way to go, given their concern with carbon linkage? Well, the, the previous, I mean, that is a, an important point. What happens if we have a domestic policy? Maybe some companies will shift overseas. Uh, our previous policy really considered that a lot and provided very generous provisions of uh, free permits to emissions intensive trade exposed companies. So the, the Garneau review recommended that, the government implemented that. So companies that are particularly prone to that type of problem of leakage were really healthily compensated. Uh, just talking about the Labor's, Labor Party's proposal at the moment, they're going to do similar. So companies in sectors which are very prone to, to leakage will get a very generous, really, type of arrangement where they get, they get a baseline. If they emit above the baseline, they can actually use 100% international permits uh, to cover any, any remaining emissions above their baseline. Uh, so in the end, the effective carbon price for those companies in those sectors will be quite small. The Labor Party's also committed to a um, strategic indus industries fund of 300 million uh, in the lead up to their ETS if it kicks in in 2020. Um, so that's to try and help equip those industries, um, you know, with with mechanisms to reduce their carbon emissions, um, potentially to find new markets or new products um, if if they're affected by the carbon price. Um, so Labor's factored that into their plan to some extent um, with that fund as well. Uh, question over here. Uh, microphone is coming to you. 
Peter from SOS. Um, in the wake of, of Paris, um, perhaps we can assume that um, in the Australian context, um, where the election looks like it's going to be fairly close and the Greens may well um, constitute some sort of balance of power or close to it, um, is it not reasonable to assume that uh, the Liberal incumbency is going to deploy tactics of uh, greenwashing um, and uh, popular um, techno fixes, that sort of thing. I mean, I've noticed um, Turnbull has been very much um, revving up the um, the idea of um, a very fast train um, from Sydney to uh, to Canberra. Um, obviously, that is going to uh, um, benefit um, the federal polys in particular. Um, but it's also perhaps a bit of a, um, a spin-off um, from the whole sort of um, public interest in uh, climate change and, and some a desire to see some sort of uh, ameliorative reform. Yeah, uh, it's, excuse me, nearly fell over. Um, it's an interesting point. Uh, I'm not so sure that a very fast train... I mean, the thing about a very fast train is it's not very fast in coming. Uh, it, gets talk, it, it gets talked about a lot, uh, usually around this point in the electoral cycle. And I'm not entirely sure what its uh, environmental impact would be anyway, but uh, I don't think too many of the politicians that are in Canberra at the moment are likely to benefit from it. But uh, nonetheless, it will be very interesting to see what the political makeup of you know, the House of Representatives in particular, but also the Senate after this election, and what, what impact that will have on the, this policy area and a range of others. Did anyone else wish to comment? We're getting quite short, short for time here. I'm not sure whether we've got another question or if you wanted to comment, Ken. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned whitewashing, I think, or greenwashing. Um, I think it's more like the cloak of invisibility, actually. There's, uh, there's very little visible from either major, either major parties uh, when it comes to their, their uh, policy uh, platforms in climate change and energy during this uh, election. But you raise one point, though, and that is electrification of transport. Now, we've talked a lot about electricity production, and sure, that's a major part of our greenhouse gas emissions, but so is transport. And uh, I think there's been quite a lot of cloak of invisibility around uh, transport policy here, uh, and that's because there are a lot of incumbents out there with uh, very loud squeaky wheels, to use an analogy. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, electrification is actually uh, great for many reasons. One is you can then produce electricity using carbon-free sources and that gets rid of the transport problem. You also increase the demand for electricity and at the moment it's decreasing. This is a threat to the grid and our, and our national electricity supply security. And also uh, it's, it's a good thing to do in terms of introducing technology that people want. Now, the reason that we don't have a very fast train is because very big lobbies over the last four decades have argued very strongly against it. And uh, if we did go down the electrification route, rail electrification would be one of the key elements. Yes, it was interesting. I, uh, I noticed that uh, VW, who of course got themselves quite a, a, a pertinent uh, example of this, got itself into so much trouble for falsifying the emissions uh, uh, measurements uh, measurings in its uh, in its vehicles has now announced that it's going to make a very heavy uh, incursion into electric vehicles in the future so that's purely a sort of a commercial response but also presumably one that uh, is aimed at rescuing its very heavily tarnished reputation I have a question just here we might have to make this the last question I think uh, my name is Anna van Duktren. Um Mainly a question for Mark, but interested in other people's views. Um, we know clim um, agriculture will be heavily, is already starting to be impacted by climate change. We know it's also a significant source of emissions, um, in Aust Australian emissions. Um, and I'm just wondering, what does a adapted and CO2 reduced agriculture look like? And is there anyone articulating that at present in Australia? Thanks, Anna. Uh, probably the short answer for that is no, um, but should it be, uh, yes. Uh, so when you look globally at, at emissions from agriculture, there are almost 30% uh, across of, of the total. So it's a, a very you know, substantial component. So that consists of direct emissions plus indirect emissions, say from land clearing. 
and, uh, and it's very much the same in Australia, although our inventory isn't structured like that to add those numbers up quickly. Um, it's roughly something in the high 20s to 30%. Uh, and so the really important thing is that in, in many cases there aren't cost-effective ways of reducing those emissions. We don't have cost-effective ways of reducing nitrous oxide from cropland or methane from livestock. And, and yet there's a significant demand for those and there will continue to be a significant demand and growing demand due to increased population and consumption of food. Now one of the realities of the world is that uh, um, people aren't very happy if they're starving um, and, uh, and when it comes down to it is that people will preference paying for food over paying for transport or, or paying for um, entertainment. Um, at, at the bottom of your um, Maslow's hierarchy is you know, food, water, safety, um, and so those are, those are critical needs. So when push comes to shove, people will actually opt for food. The importance of that is that that big sector, that 30%, where we don't have much in the way of emission reductions, is actually going to um, be there and be there on a continuing basis, given our current R&D or lack of R&D to reduce it. And even though other sectors are going to potentially reduce their emissions, that will actually make agriculture a bigger and bigger proportion of the total uh, and increase the pressure on agricultural emission reductions. And so, so what we'll have is, is a, almost like a fixed uh, component in our system where we don't have too many options to do, do about it. So I would actually argue that that is a, a really strong rationale for taking a really positive um, stance in terms of research and development connected with industry to actually start reducing those emissions in cost-effective ways. Thanks, Mark. We'll just have a very quick final question from the front here. Hi, I'm Michelle Smith. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, I'd just like to challenge the suggestion that um, developing countries will be worse off if they don't have access to cheap coal. Um, and I wonder instead whether wealthy countries like Australia should be helping developing countries to develop renewables. That's a good question. I presume there is some work going on in this space, but... Um, yeah. Indeed. So, uh, to address the second part of your question, yes, absolutely. And indeed, uh, the ANU, through the Australian Indonesia Centre, we're a partner in that, is talking to the Indonesian government about uh, ways in which they could uh, increase their portfolio of, uh, of, of non-fossil fuel sources in the future. Uh, we've got a delegation visiting this week, actually, to discuss exactly these issues. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, the impact of coal exports in developing countries, uh, so they, they have very little choice. Uh, they have existing coal-fired power stations. Uh, they don't have a lot of money to invest. They can't suddenly switch from coal to an alternative fuel source, uh, even if uh, there was a political will to do so. Uh, so to turn off the coal supply to those countries would be condemning them to a life of poverty and a life of, uh, of uh, inequality uh, that really it's not within our, um, in, in, within our uh, responsibility to, to uh, dictate. And so that's why I'm saying coal won't go away immediately. It'll transition out to 2050 when we need to be carbon neutral. Uh, but in the meantime, we can't condemn the developing world to a lower standard of living than they would have otherwise had. Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting point to finish on that. I, I travelled to India with uh, Tony Abbott when he was still Prime Minister and uh, he was obviously talking to Adani officials there about the, the giant Carmichael mine, which is a very controversial, uh, enormous venture. And one of his justifications was uh, that very point about uh, delivering electricity to what he said was 100 million people. Uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of uh, Australia's coal exports to, to India. So uh, uh, those issues are, you know, I suppose that, that, that they're the sort of hinge point moments of policy where you have to work out how do you get from here to there and who gets, who gets ground up in the process. I, I think um, with the example of Indonesia, I mean, they're trying to uh, expand their electricity grid. They still have a, a large proportion. Of, is it 20% of the population without electricity? A large fraction. Larger. Um, and at the moment, the Indonesian government's trying to uh, do... Uh, they also have a 23% um, renewables target um, for 2020. Um, Mark, did you want to interject? Two quick final comments. Just, just on, in terms of that question, because I think it is a really important question. I, I think it is very context dependent. And, and if you look at India, um, there's a, a big push to get electricity out to you know, huge portions of the population that don't have that electricity. And, and oftentimes that's presented as a centralised model. So it's 
It's big coal-fired power stations, um, big grid systems to actually deliver that. But the World Bank has actually come out with an analysis that says it's actually much better from a point of view of economics and in terms of regional development to go to actually a small-scale dis distributed grid system um, which actually uses a lot more renewables than it does coal. So, so I think a lot of this is actually dependent on the context, so where you are, how close you are to existing grid and power systems, and it's dependent on the political context as well. But, but it's very clear now that um, putting in new renewable systems, um, that's wind and, and solar PV, uh, is actually cheaper than putting in new coal. So if you're actually going to scale out new systems, um, the rationale, I think, is going to be increasingly that it's going to be renewable. Yeah, that's a really fabulous point, Paul. Yeah, coal is not going to be turned off overnight, but certainly for new generation capacity uh, in developing countries these days, renewables are competitive. Uh, so solar in Indonesia, for example, is competitive with coal. Uh, but unfortunately, there are still plans to, to build quite a lot of new coal-fired generators in Indonesia and elsewhere. Uh, but but I, I agree with the, the questioner. For new build facilities, uh, the economics have changed and uh, the advice would be, if possible, go renewables. Coal-fired generators are around for a long time and they create so much local pollution as well as carbon emissions. Uh, so the economics does say, if, if, if it's possible, uh, electricity provision is very important, but we really should be aiming solar. Thanks very much. I think we'll have to end it there. It's a, it's a cold night and uh, Hardy Canberrans are out here talking about a very important policy issue. And I really want to thank you for staying with us through this, uh, through this very interesting uh, discussion. Can we please thank Mark Howden, Ken Baldwin, Paul Burke and Lee Bernstein.